songs. I, I love it. There are times that I may slip up, won't we'll always get it right. Guarantee I'll be on top of this game said life. There are times that I may slip up, won't we'll always get it right. Guarantee I'll be on top of this game said life. Get up and show up, don't never lose your fight. You watching me from the couch, at least I say I tried. A long time ago, someone said this stuck with me. Passion with that action will only remain a dream. Keep positive, motivated people on your team. Cause other negativity can kill your self esteem. Believing is powerful, but sadly so is doubt. So you can choose which way you wanna go, which route. The mind that controls the body can beat anybody. And gotta be all in, don't treat your dreams like a hobby. And if you practice on your day off, won't have an off day. Talent alone won't get you there, still got a long way. Gotta take big risks and big steps to strive. Wanna be the winner when it's game set live. Whoa. That's right. If you want to be a winner, join Rick Macy and David Meltzer here on Game Set Life. I am blessed to have an incredible co-host. So relevant today uh, in the tennis world. There's probably, of all sports, more news floating around uh, in the tennis world than anywhere else as we're coming off an incredible week of tennis and an incredible championship. So, Welcome to Game Set Life, my dear friend, Rick Macy. No, it's, it's great to be here. Usually we meet on Tuesday. It's Friday. But I always tell everybody, instead of, thank God it's Friday, I always say, thanks God it's today. I think everybody <laughs> should look at it differently. But uh, no, I'm ready to roll. Yeah, we get another chance every single day. And it's so nice to have it every single week, Game Set Life. And we're going to be having an amazing guest, as usual. Uh, Rick Macy attracts the best. That's all I have to say. But Rick, give me a little bit of an update. We had a bit of what may have seemed to be an upset uh, in Wimbledon, and it was an extraordinary match. I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was uh, an athletic feed. And I think I want to start there because I don't think a lot of people understand you know, what it's like to play tennis at that level for almost five hours. Uh, give me some analogous uh, physical, exertive, professional sports that are equivalent to playing that type of tennis for that long. Oh, I think we got frozen, Nick. Uh, anyway, uh, we will uh, edit this out. But since we're live, I'm going to go ahead and take a question while we wait for Rick. And uh, this one is, who are some of the sports heroes and why? Uh, my sports heroes uh, range from uh, Tony Gwynn in baseball, uh, Roberto Clemente in baseball, not just because they were the best uh, at what they did, but it was what they did off the field. Uh, they are known, in fact, the Clemente Award, which Tony Gwynn won, uh, at one time is the only award that's solely based on character, not even performance. And so uh, my heroes are the ones that are at the highest level, the Warren Moons, the Jackie Robinsons, uh, the Tony Gwynns, the Roberto Clementes uh, that changed uh, the way that we look at things, that changed the way off the field that we do things. And, uh, you know, for me, Tony Gwynn's probably one of my favorites, even though Warren Moon was my business partner for so many years, and I worked with the Jackie Robinson Foundation and Rachel Robinson and giving the Clemente Award, all the different things I've been able to do. Uh, it is, you know, the pure fact that uh, people that are literally willing to stay till hours afterwards to pour into the community and to represent not only the community, but individual kids to give them uh, the pathway of what they can do and what they can be. Looks like Rick Mason's back, Nick. There we go. Hi, Rick. Are you, am I here? You're here and there. You're everywhere. It's a new I'm like, rhyme. I'm like MasterCard. I'm everywhere. But no, to answer, answer your question, I don't know how much I got in. I, first off, I love the question. David, when you see greatness, and remember, um, three years ago, I called this on Alcaraz. You know, I actually called it that, in my opinion, because this is what I do. As you know, I evaluate talent. A lot of times when they're younger, I can kind of see where this is going. And I said he was a combination of Djokovic, Federer, Nadal, and Agassi. And it was interesting in the press conference when they talked to Joker, he said, 
I would agree that uh, Alcarez is a combination of me, Roger, and Rafa. And he goes, I saw that a year ago, and that's a true assessment. So now I got the Joker kind of saying, because he, he, he has common threads, which we all know about common threads, of those guys. So he has like that Spanish bull mentality, but it's, it's all wrapped in one. So, but what the answer your question, they're playing on the fastest surface known to man, and they're out there for almost five hours. Okay. And one guy is going for a record, and another guy is playing on his worst surface. Alcarez, listen, he that's not his best surface, but he got better with each match. But his belief and shot making ability, both players, you don't realize. They're hitting quality off of quality. And then where the rest of the world might chip it or lob it, they're hitting winners. And people have no idea what they're looking at. But you know what is great about this? Joker's not going anywhere. There's going to be a rivalry. There's a new sheriff in town. But Djokovic isn't going anywhere. But what a match. I mean, just what tennis needed at this time. And more importantly, with uh, Alcarez, what I love about him, gratitude humility, great upbringing. You know, he was in her, this is a classic quote. And I'm, I told all the kids this, they, he did an interview on one of the TV networks and they go, well, okay, what next? What next? David, listen to this. This is one of my all time favorites. She goes, I got to get a lot better. That's amazing. That's the way greatness thinks. They know some, they look, they know someone's coming behind, but it came from the heart. I love this guy. Barring injury, we're seeing something special. Yeah, and not to discount Djokovic because uh, lucky to be friends with his wife and to be around the humility of him and how much he gives back to his communities. And it's going to be a great rivalry of two great leaders and great athletes. And you even know the athleticism better than I do. There was a moment, uh, what I call the subtlety of sports, and it goes beyond the game. Uh, there's certain things that I notice from being around uh, the game for so long in sports for so long. I'll give you an example. We did a lot of work with Cam Newton when he made the Super Bowl. Uh, we had commented, Warren and I, that the game may be a little bit bigger uh, for Cam. He was the MVP that season. He was playing almost a perfect season. But when you wait two weeks and you get into the Super Bowl and you've never been there before, it's a different animal. And yeah. one of the subtleties that I noticed was that Cam got knocked on his butt. And none of his linemen or fellow players went over and tried to help him back up. And one of the things that we had coached Cam on mindset wise and had talked to him about is uh, being accountable and not blaming your, your line. And, you know, he had had a reputation uh, to allow his ego to interfere with his success. And we were like, no matter whether you win or lose, you want to be a class act like a Warren Moon uh, was through his career and other athletes that we represented. And sure enough, when those linemen didn't reach over to help him up when he was knocked on his butt, I said, I think we're going to have a problem uh, with Cam this game. I, I don't, he must be, things aren't going well right now. And instead of lifting up ever, everyone like a Tom Brady, as you saw him at halftime of the Super Bowl, when he was so far down, he's knocking his players down in blame, shame, and justification. I saw a subtlety, and I wanted you to comment on it in the match uh, with Djokovic. At the end, Joker, he smirked out of humility at the kid. He, he gave a, a passing of the baton, the passing of the torch, and he said, hey, you got me this time. And it, it was such a smooth look on his face of, hey, the better man won today, but you better have your back because you have just inspired me that I have to get a little bit better uh, to beat you. And congratulations, and I respect what you did today. And there was no nothing but humility in, in that look. Did you see that type of, of, of a look or attitude in Djokovic uh, when he lost? Absolutely. But, but he's always been like that. That's why he's never really been the flavor of the month, like Federer or Nadal. You know, some those guys were always like the crowd loved him. He's always been a little bit on the edge, a little bit controversial. You know what I mean? He probably would have had three or four more slams if he wouldn't have hit the ball boy three or four years ago at the U.S. Open. 
He got kicked out of Australia. Remember, he didn't, he couldn't come and play because of the vaccine mandate. So he's always been like a rebel. But Dave, this guy hangs out with the wolves. Literally, this guy eats grass. He thinks he's a goat. You got to understand the wiring he visualizes every day. This guy is a different animal. And that look, he probably just was so competitive. He gave him the look, but in the press conference, a lot of humility, a lot of congrats, okay? Uh, a lot of praise for the guy. So he was a class act. Everybody in tennis really admired his, you know, the way he handled everything. But you're right. He's going to work harder. He's going to add a few subtleties to his game. Listen, it could have went either way. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, listen, it's, we know there's a fine line between a champion and a runner up in every sport, you know, a call, a break here or there. So, but it will make him work a little harder. He'll add a few things. Listen, I, I think it's great for tennis because it just raises the temperature even more. Yeah. It's amazing what rivalries do. Uh, and I can't wait to see the next match between those two extraordinary tennis players. Um, if you are the coach, uh, of either of these players uh, coming back after that match, you know, what are you working on accordingly with each of those athletes? First off, I, I love this question. You know, first off, let's go with Alcarez. You know, everything, once again, even though it already changed, everything is going to change around him even more, uh, especially his bank account. You know what I mean? That's going to change a lot. Okay. And the, the goal of the coach is to, you know, keep him locked in. I got to get better. I got to get better, you know, on the competition, anybody, anytime, anywhere, everything's around you going to change, but it's a ball, a net, a racket in the other side, the guy on the other side, your job is to knock him out, but everything's going to change around him. So I think it's more of a mental thing with Alcarez because remember, David, he's 20 years old. You know, he's still a young guy that's going to get, unfortunately for the others, bigger, stronger, faster, quicker, smarter, and the big C, which is more confident. When you start feeling like Superman on the court, which he already believes it, you saw him play at the end of the match. That's uncanny for a 20-year-old to be able to flip the script and pull that match off. So I think it's more of that because he's on the right track because he can do it all. I think with Djokovic, Okay, he does have to add a few subtleties to his game if he does play Alcarez to make life easier. But listen, I think he's done a good, lot of good things with 23 Grand Slams, 10 Australian, you know, seven Wimbledons, you know, three French, three U.S. I mean, come on. I think he knows what's going on, but he does have to add a little bit there. And the most important thing is he has to show I'm still the GOAT and I'm not going anywhere. So it's not time for the Joker to burn all the boats. <laughs> no, we'll leave that. We'll leave that to, to Matt. But no, listen. Yeah, that's what you don't want to do. You don't want to overplay your hand. You know, you don't want to overreact. I mean, there's a fine line. Listen, this conversation would be different if Djokovic wins six four in the fifth. You know, yeah. we'd be talking something. A whole the whole world would be talking something different. And it's a fine line. Okay, but I think it's going to mo motivate both players even more. Not a lot of change, but I think for Alcarez, you just got to keep your head in the game, which he will, because he's already shown me that. And that's why I went long ago. He's a generational talent. We never saw this ever in a young man. If he doesn't get hurt, this guy's future is off the charts. Well, we've seen it in young women because you've coached all of them uh, at a young age that had this type of success and challenge. Now, Matt Higgins is in the green room. He'll give me a little wave when he is ready in the next minute. But, Rick, he's ready. Okay, good. I was going to ask you, you know, what was going to be better off for Alcaraz, not his bank account, but for his mindset, winning or losing the match? Uh, keep that in mind. We'll do it after uh, as a closeout. So keep that question in mind. Cause I'm curious what you think is a legendary hall of fame coach of the greatest tennis players ever to play. Speaking of the greatest ever to play, this is one of my friends that I think the world of, and uh, he has written an extraordinary book. He is an extraordinary leader. He pours into the community like nobody else that I know. He is humble, but also transparent. He's going to tell it like it is. And I'm blessed to have him here with Rick Macy and I on Game Set Life. Matt Higgins, welcome to the show. 
Thanks for having me. It was like magic. I'm here. <laughs> it was like magic. Hi. All right. I have a treat for you. Uh, Rick Macy has an extraordinary talent. He is a middle weight, <laughs> a middle age mutant rap star, and he does his introductions via the Ohio State tradition of rapping an intro for you with a great rhyme and a great cadence so just sit back for a minute and receive one of the best introductions you'll ever have rick macy it's time Hi, make it happen what are the common threads with me serena and matt higgins yeah no matt we got so many common threads first off welcome to the show but we're going way back down memory lane to queen when you didn't have a lot of means but now you're making, but just sit back and here we go. Number one, you ran the show with the Finns. A lot, a lot of nice wins. Tannenball begins every day full of spins. Venus and Serena, small piece of the Finns. The Compton Comets delivered brutal spins. They love the fish in the Miami moon. The Hall of Fame awaits them soon. Ohio's finest always wins, gets out of spins. His words are powerful to the tune. He loves Miami, but even more, Warren Moon. All right, number two. Okay, you see 100 deals a day, some okay. Make, some make hay, got to make the hay. MH, okay, puts them in play. Serena was the real deal. Opponents would kneel. Best serve ever. Very clever. SW, never say never. David is the real deal, has uncanny feel. His journey is surreal. He went from sinner to world-class winner, all right? Number three, you were great in the tank, money in the bank. At 16, dropped out of school, but burning the boats would be the rule. Serena never tanked, always spanked, was a shark, Compton bark, electric spark by burning the boat, SW, now Mrs. Goat. Akron's finest, built like a tank, unreal gratitude and thank, can float a quote, live or remote, on stage or even on a boat, DM everybody's vote. And number four, Matt, number four, we're almost done here. Flushing is where it began, self-made man, mindset, I can, you just ran, had a boatload plan. The sisters dominated at flushing with never be seen, seen before brushing and crushing opponents still cussing. Okay. No, the last one, David was cussing because the Meltzer family toilet wasn't flushing. He had a plan with the rotor rooter man who came in his van with a plunger and knife. Enough of this. Let's get on with game set life. Showtime. Let's go. Man. <laughs> I particularly love the use of flushing, you know, because I was a guy born in a place called flushing, very inauspicious beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. No problem. I'm, I'm impressed. I really no, no, you got, you got potential. Now I'll turn it over to Dave. Here we oh, go. Oh, <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of potential, uh, that's what Matt does. There's certain people that are able to give directions of where they are. There's certain people that can teach how to get there. But the finest, like Matt Higgins, they bring the best out of you. And if you read his book and you watch him on TV and you listen to him in his interviews and on the speeches that he gives on stages, they're all geared to one thing, to that potential. How does each individual allow themselves to not limit their own self-image, to allow yourself to look at you and your potential and say, do I have to burn those boats? And this latest book has inspired me to challenge myself of where I'm limiting myself and limiting myself with relationships and opportunities, options, touches, a favor. Matt, at what point in your career as a super successful business person, have you had to burn the boats and realize that you're still limiting yourself and your own self-image? Oh my God, probably every morning. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I always say my, my book is the ultimate accountability partner. And then I wrote my book, so I read my book, right? I, I always want to asterisk the shit out of my book to be like, I think I see things and I think I, I have the codes from a humbly, from a life of experience, but knowing is different than applying and implementing. And so I want to make clear to anybody out there because I do think it's a disservice when you reach a certain level to act like you've got it all figured out. 
I may know what figuring it out looks like, but I can't, uh, you know, always apply it. So my original burn the boats, you know, move and that I'm trying to replicate throughout my entire life was when I dropped out of high school. We talked for a second about that. You know, I grew up in in poverty and selling flowers on street corners. And, uh, you know, when you're when you grow up in those situations, anybody out there who has can relate. You go through this disillusionment phase for you have hope. Usually if you've got a single mom, you hope a guy comes along and rescues everybody and turns out most guys are crap or you know things just don't work out. But you become totally dis- – so I became very disillusioned when I was a young kid watching my mom kind of slip away, feeling I had this potential, wanting to be a selfish kid because that's natural, and then and then no cavalry is coming. And so my, my burn the boats move was a hack that I discovered by virtue of my mom, which is uh, that if you drop out of high school and get a GED, technically – if you did well on that test, you can go to any college uh, in America, at least back then. And the reason why that mattered is I was making three seventy-five at McDonald's, and as a college student, you can make eight bucks. So I had this crazy plan, which I presented proudly with hubris to the universe, and everyone said I was going to be a loser, rightfully, <laughs> as you might expect. And so, why that's such an important part of my, my my DNA is they were so convinced that they were right. They didn't have information about what I was dealing with because I was concealing it because I was ashamed. I was living in a roach motel and I had nice Jordache jeans to cover it up because that's how I use my money from Ill- illegally scalping tickets. Whatever I had to do was to cover it up. So learn that, you know, oftentimes you're getting bad advice because people don't have a window into the truth because you're not showing them. And then three, the world and systems are set up for the average case, not the edge case. So you have to ask yourself, am I an edge case or am I the average case, right? Because it's efficient to have schools that deal with average cases, not edge cases, right? So <clears throat> if you're an edge case, you need a bespoke solution to your life. And I was an edge case. And then lastly, that the best way to get the best out of you is to give yourself uh, no option, self-sabotage. And so I dry, I failed every single one of my classes in high school except for typing, which I'll kick both your asses. I don't even know how fast you <laughs> type. But I, I am, I, you know, Rick, you're a very talented man. I have no athletic ability except for bowling, but I'm a damn good typist because that's the one class I passed. But, um, and then it all worked out as, you know, um, uh, you, you know the story, but it all ended up working out. So there, I, I constantly have to return to that, wait a second, like, how did you get here? Oh, you gave yourself no option. You stopped being oppositional to things that you already had to do. You know, we all resist ourselves, right? Like every day it's a battle to go to the gym or, you know, and, and I, I've really worked hard to say stopping oppositional to that, which is inevitable and use your own self-will, deny yourself will on things that work better when they're habituated and give yourself will and freedom to burn the boats for things that require breakout success through edge case, you know, and resist conventionalism. So that's a long way of saying every single day I have to resupply my resolve to burn the boats. No, I, I love that. Let me let me back the truck up. just Yeah, a little please. Bit. Yeah, well, back to truck up. Okay, you you dropped out of school. Obviously, you're not recommending that because you're wired different. You're very persistent. You weren't going to take no for an answer. Things were going to blow up every day, and that made you try harder instead of retreat. Take us from there to you know the press secretary. Kind of give us the the journey a little bit, so everybody can just see it's not rainbow lollipop and sunshine. Yeah, it's how you react to the adversity. And when I read your story, okay. Uh, it's a, you said about typing, you are my type because that was amazing. All the things that you you just would put your nose down and keep going. So I think people need to hear that part of your story. Yeah, and I and I, I'm glad you you bring that up because I I really want to be very clear to not airbrush the messy stuff. And again, that also does a disservice. And so you know I, I have this epiphany that the cavalry is not coming, and then this intuition in my mother that we're we're in a, we're in a desperate race against time. She said she's going to succumb psychologically and physically. And so I go from 16 year old dropout and I was a great communicator. So I was like, what can I leverage to get the hell out of poverty quickly? Well, for whatever reason, I have a gift with words. I'm going to be a writer. And I got a job as a little cub reporter and I leveraged the crap out of that job. I was doing muck raking for, you know, turning potholes into minefields, you know, blowing things up and no one would take me very seriously, but they took the New York Times for serious, seriously. So I would partner up with reporters at the big boy newspapers, give them all my source material, and then we'd work on stories together. So I was in this little free newspaper, Queen's Tribune, but then blowing myself up. And then Carl Bernstein bought a piece of the newspaper and nominated me for a Pulitzer Prize when I was 19 or 20. We all can nominate each other for a Pulitzer Prize, by the way. It sounds better than it is. But Carl Bernstein was pretty cool. But an endless attempt to leverage what I'm doing to keep an eye on the clock, 
to ask myself, what can I do today that I couldn't do yesterday that brings me closer to what I want to do tomorrow? All right, now I'm a reporter. Now I probably can get the attention of the mayor's office. Let me get a, a crappy job delivering newspapers in the morning. But if I ghost write some speeches without my name on it, they're going to get addicted. And they did. And I'm going to quit when I don't get the job I want. When I Then I'm going to come back when they double my salary. And then I'm going to quit again when I don't get the job I want. So I, I did all those moves leveraging. And I go from three seventy five dollars an hour at McDonald's you know, 15, 16, to finally getting a job, $100,000 a year at age 26 in a span of a decade, from GED to 12 year, 11 years of school a night, seven years in college, two jobs, four years in law school. My big moment comes, I finally have enough to get out of poverty. My mom is on the clock. She's sucking oxygen in that chair. I go to work that day at City Hall and she dies at 11 o'clock that morning. And so... It's still hard. I always keep that fresh because I don't want those words to be just words. I don't want to be a movie. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to be a movie. Like, th this is real. But um, I keep it fresh. So I always empathize with people going through it. Um, within that story is everything about life, right? You have this intuition about what we're capable of, what we're meant to be. We, we see a threat that others don't see. We, people call us paranoid. Um, and no cavalry comes. And so my mother's story does end without her ever being able to leverage her education, without her ever leaving that chair, without her ever um, getting on an airplane or driving a car. Uh, but at the same time, her little boy went off and flew away because she gave me the greatest gift that a parent can give a child, which partly inspired this book. When everyone else in the world said I was insane for wanting to drop out of high school, the one person uh, who responded to it positively, my mom said, that's a pretty clever idea. You could do, you could do anything. And that gift of unlimited, limitless faith has stuck with me forever. And I tell parents all the time, and I'll stop here. When you tell your kids, when they tell you I'm the next Messi or I'm the next Serena, and you tell them like, mm, you better have a backup plan and get a soulless job as an accountant, no disrespect, but sorry, some disrespect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what you're telling your kid is it's not safe. I don't believe you. And what I say often, all the time, do you think your kid is going to have a hard time figuring out what soulless job they're going to take when things don't work out? They're going to do just fine. For me, it would have been a lawyer. No disrespect, but part disrespect. I have my fancy wallpaper right there called Fordham Law Degree that I never used once, but it's my backup plan hanging on the background. So I'll stop there. But that 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 is the 10-year journey from success, triumph, and then uh, unfortunately her passing away. <clears throat> Hey, Matt, uh, that story has meant so much, not only to you, but so many people. And we share a lot of similarities uh, growing up. And, you know, my mom gave me a freedom that was hedging like your law degree on your your piece of paper on your wall of you could do whatever you want after graduate school. And so uh, it was a, a little of a hedge on that pure belief in her son. I had to have uh, the mitigation of risk to have a law degree just in case I wasn't everything I thought I would be. Um, but one of the things that comes across in your book um, is, I think, a superpower that you have. And it goes beyond what emotional intelligence a lot of great entrepreneurs have, teachers. You have an ability to see invisible assumptions. And and I, I've been blessed to be in business conversations with you, channel partnerships, friendships, uh, and social events. And I'm always amazed how someone is presenting something to you, whether it's on Shark Tank or in a business situation, and your mind not only sees the emotional aspects, but somehow can look and see what the invisible, the the assumptions that aren't apparent to anyone else in the room and you're able to twist the situation and say what you're saying may be true, but what if that person isn't telling the truth or what if this wasn't the situation and you see these invisible assumptions, has that been a natural genetic or energetic inheritance or is it something that you're cognizant of that you work at thinking and looking deeper, being more interested than interesting? Such a thank you, by the way, first of all, because that's probably the highest compliment I would ever want to receive is that, you know, you see the interstitial, right? You see the, like in the matrix when he slows down the bullets and like, yeah. like you know, sort of slow it down. I do pride myself on it. And here's why every, like every, every, uh, every crisis, right? Births an opportunity. That's true. We all know that. Right. But um, I think that the consolation prize of trauma of early trauma is refined pattern recognition. 
And it's, it's some of it is a uh, neurochemical and physiological that if you spend all your time hyper aroused, like I did as a child, I used to wrap a towel around my head so I could hear through the fibers because my mother would cry all night in pain for years. And I would always want to know, is this the night we'd always go to the ER and like, it was, no one ever did anything, but like that hyper arousal, the benefit of it is you're scanning the environment all the time for sirens. And when you do scan the environment all the time, you do start to see the unseen, hear that which isn't said. And that is the benefit. Downside is, you know, you never sleep for the next 30, 40 years, but the benefit. Yeah. And so I share that because I know a lot of people have dealt with trauma and they have people in their life who be like, get over it already. That's a little harder when your brain, your amygdala is like a grapefruit, you know, even right. though you, David, I think about you every day, every damn morning. Cause I'm like, how does David get up and meditate right away? Whereas like, I want to attack. I'm honestly, I get up with a good bathroom like seven times a night. I'm looking for the sun. Like, is it up yet? Can I get up? All right. But the consolation prize of that madness is, um, is pattern recognition. And I love surfacing the missing conversations. I love being able to be like, what? And the book, I think, touches upon some of them. We could talk about one for a second. That's my favorite. It's this societal bias towards incrementalism that life and success and unfolds like sedimentary rock, like gently placed. First, you have the lemonade stand, then you get the lemonade franchise, then you get North America, you know, and corporations organize us that way because it's efficient. You'll be a manager of marketing, then you get a promotion. We're all like cogs in the, you know, in the wheel. And whenever I see somebody, I like to challenge like, who made that rule? Because I was victimized by one of those rules, right? Young man, you'll go to high school. Mom's dying. And I'm eating effing government cheese. LinkedIn, can't curse. I'm eating effing government cheese. Like, and you're telling me, and I'm carrying a butterfly knife when I'm coming home from the deli at two in the morning. And you want me to go to English class? Like, it doesn't really make sense. And so I like to surface the, um, the unseen. And, and I appreciate you saying that. But I do think, if I'm honest, it is partly a result of, of, of a lot of trauma and a lot of frustration, a lot of sadness. Rick, bring us home, man. This guy is full of nuggets and gold. By the way, a little tribute to my Diet Coke, which could one day will be on the black market, but I'm hoarding them. I want to play homage to this little beautiful thing. I'm going to back the truck up again. First off, I, I love, I love, listen, Matt, I love your mom just because of the belief. And David, I talked to you about this before. And I'll bring up not every everybody I teach. I try to extract greatness and move mountains and get them to do things they can never do. But VW and Serena. OK, it was always the best compliment ever, especially at the red carpet, the after party. They go, Rick, we were just brainwashed by you on our dad to be number one. OK, you got to have the good. You got to have the talent. You know, you got to have other attributes. But the mindset, OK, it was always a bigger picture. The belief was like, I'm supposed to do this, you know, and we expect you to do that. But more importantly, they did. And they had the other physical attributes to achieve that. So when you put limitations on people, that's not the sign of a mentor or a coach. You got to extract things because no one knows what's inside a child and all parents should understand that. I love that. Rick, will you be my hype man? Everyone? Yes. Because I, I, I need one, especially I'm, I'm having one of those days without getting into, it's like a remarkable day where if you were to catalog everything that could have gone wrong, even on your worst day in the beginning of a month, I wouldn't have had this list. It's just like, it's actually what's peaceful about it. It's everything I've been paranoid that could go wrong. It's happening today. And I, and, and, and my son was asking me like, are you upset? I'm like, no, actually it shows me that I might, I might be onto something. <laughs> Every bad thing is happening this Friday, right now. Love it. <laughs> it is right not even 13. Well, well, good seeing you both. I appreciate it. Dave, you're such a sweetheart. Rick, you have such a kind face. It's nice to spend time. I needed this interlude today before I go back into the trenches, but I appreciate it. I was going to say, I hope we're included or not included in the worst day that, that is on that list. Hopefully we have brightened it with Game Set Life. You are one of the kindest and most intelligent people that I know. An intelligent follower is the way that I describe a great leader. And that to me is what Matt Higgins is. Matt, I look forward to seeing you my next trip to New York or somewhere else around the world. You're incredible. Thanks Thank for you. And that. lastly, anybody who's read Burn the Boats, your DMs to me saying how you've made change uh, sustains me. I'm not kidding. I read every single DM about the book. You telling me that the book made you make a change gets me up the next day to keep pushing the book despite people maybe rolling their eyes. There he goes again. It's changing people's lives. So if you let me know, you give me, you give me one more day. So please DM me. I will I say it in person. That book is incredible. Thank you for writing it. Thank it's you. impacted my team and me. You're the best. Thanks, Matt Higgins. Best. Bye, Rex. Thanks, Matt. Bye, Bye, guys. See you later.
Another wow. Florida finest. We are so blessed to have these guys. Now, Rick, we have a few moments, so I want to recap uh, before we get to the takeaway. Well, let's let's do the takeaway from that. Uh, what is your takeaway from that interview? Well, listen, you know, people have to understand they, it's not where you start. Once again, it's where you finish. I mean, look, dropped out of school. You know, his mom's, you know, dying. And look where he's at today and look what he's done. But he's taken that to fuel the fire. He's had crisis after crisis after crisis. And look, he's still fired up today. He's trying to get better today. It's like when you text me, you said about, you know, the best coach. I said, I got better today. Okay. No, I, I love that mindset. And I think people, if they would buy into that, because people always watch what they eat. Why don't they watch what they put into their head? You know what I mean? And who you listen to. I mean, this guy is a champion at champion. I love his story. Yeah. And behind ever, every super successful person whose life seems to be perfect. Uh, Matt Higgins, who has a Shark Tank, uh, incredible TV show. He has billion dollars working for the uh, incredible Mr. Ross in a variety of ways. He's still human. And what I love most, my takeaway, is that no matter where we are, winning or losing Wimbledon, billionaire on Shark Tank, or the greatest tennis coach of all time, we are still human. And it's important to remind not only ourselves, but everyone else, that with transparency and humility, that we're still fighting the fight. We're fighting the fight every day and our lives are not perfect. And the more we illuminate the vulnerable status of where we are every day, the more supportive we can be to others that their life is okay and that they still have another chance to get to where they wanna be. They can burn the boats overboard, unleash your potential, which is what Rick Macy, Matt Higgins, and I do my best to try to help as well on Game Set Life. Rick Macy, real quick before we leave, I really was curious about that uh, question of whether Alcaraz would have been better or worse off for winning uh, or losing. Oh, of course, he froze right at the very percent end. Better. For winning. One million percent better winning. Oh, for 100%. No, no. He's already went down the other path, like, you know, of, of losing. He's at a different level. Winning, confidence breeds confidence. That's the best thing ever. Like I said, some things are going to change. Okay. Now, if he'd have lost, it wouldn't have mattered. But he won. It went to another level mentally for him. He's going to become even mentally stronger. And now people are really understanding this guy is generational like we've never seen. You know, it's like, unbelievable. so he you never, because where he's at his career, winning is the best thing that could have happened because he didn't even, he didn't even like to play on grass. David, this wasn't his best surface, but you know what? Every night he'd be watching video of the great Roger Federer. Okay. What goes on behind the curtain? No one knows. They don't know the preparation and the detail when they turn on their TV set and see those football games on Sunday or those tennis matches. He's watching Federer so he could get better on grass. The best thing that ever happened to him was winning that match. The insight that we get today on Game Set Life from Matt Higgins and now Rick Macy, you can't find it anywhere else. That's why we're encouraging everyone to join us. Thank you, Hall of Fame tennis coach, thought leader, and friend, the incredible Rick Macy, joining us on Game Set Life. All right, Dave. We'll see you soon. Thank you. I sure hope so. Take care. He's amazing. I want my picture. I'm gonna, when I get to Boca, I'm going to take a picture with Rick and I'm going to make him hang it behind him in the studio, even if he takes it down after the show. I want to be on that Hall of Fame with the Hall of Famer himself, Rick Macy. Thank you so much. If you're not enjoying this, there's something wrong with you. Thank you for joining us today at Game Set Life. We are bringing the best out of you. Unleash your potential with Rick Macy. Enjoy yourself. Be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. Hit it, Nick. There are times that I may slip up, won't always get it right. Guarantee I'll be on top when it's game said life. Get up and show up, don't never lose your fight. You watching me from the couch, at least I say I tried. A long time ago, someone said they're stuck with me. 
passion will that action will only remain a dream keep positive motivated people on your team cause other negativity can kill your self esteem believing is powerful but sadly so is doubt so you can choose which way you wanna go which route the mind that controls the body can beat anybody and gotta be all in don't treat your dreams like a hobby and if you practice on your day off won't have an off day talent alone won't get you there still got a long way gotta take big risk and big steps to strive wanna be the winner when it's game set live whoa